Thank you for letting me speak today. I'm going to talk about uh, biophotonics and phototherapy, and rather cheekily, well, I'll put snakeskin oil. Because when I actually set out on this uh, voyage about five years ago, and I was talking to the NHS, and I was talking to academics, and I was looking for support, there was a really big question, and the NHS themselves actually thought it might be snakeskin oil. And I've tried very, very hard over the years to present the evidence, you know, gather, do the trials, get the evidence, and present it. And actually, it's all coming back now because recently in, in, in the Northeast, in County Durham, we're going to develop the National Institute for Biophotonics. So it really is coming back, back again. To do that, I've actually worked with a number of universities. I think I've funded 54 university research projects in five years. And I've managed to raise about 14 million pounds of grant funding to do that. And when I talk to people about how much money, taxpayers' money, that I've used to, to get this, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, to where we are, there's a few raised eyebrows. How the hell can you go through 14 million pounds? And, you know, and in fact, all of that money that I've raised has gone to my research partners. It's all gone to universities. And we only take a very tiny slice of that. And we fund a lot of very clever people. So when I think about my company, we're very small. We're based in Sedgefield, about 20 minutes south of here, at Net Park. And I have about 25 employees. But I actually think I've got three times that number because I'm funding all these very clever people around the country and abroad as well. So, sex oil or the interaction between biological items and photons. I think it's the latter, and I'll tell you why. That's my credentials, and, and, and as Stephanie said, I was an artist. I, I was moderately successful, sort of. Um, I had a good dealer. I had a dealer in Paris, a dealer in Berlin, and I was showing work. And in fact, that's, that's a picture uh, just to show you, I painted really big things, huge things. And that's in Scotland at the Talbot Rice. And, uh, and about 10 years ago, a little bit more, 12 years ago, uh, I decided that it was really hard work actually being an artist, very, very hard work. And, and there was a realization and you know, maturity that I actually wasn't that good either. So, so I, I used to live abroad, I came back to the UK and, and, I, and I literally met someone in a pub. It's, it's a great story and it's completely true. It was in the Bluebells in Soho. And the person I was talking to showed me a bit of uh, very early stage technology, a piece of something called electroluminescence. Uh, and I was absolutely fascinated. I was completely seduced by the technology. And, and immediately I sort of thought, wow, I, I can do something with this. This is fantastic. Unbeknown to myself that all the big companies, Kodak and, and, uh, and, and uh, LG, etc., were all researching this technology anyway, but not coming from that science background. I didn't actually know that. So I jumped in and created a company, and that company actually became incredibly successful. And this is just some of the examples. This dress is designed by a local boy, uh, Gareth Pugh, and he's a, a, a fashion designer, achingly trendy. He came to see me over ooh, 12 years ago. So I built this dress for him 12 years ago. And there's no trickery, there's no CGI, that's real. You can put it on and it illuminates and it's flexible, you can walk around with it. Uh, he used this in his uh, defile um, uh, uh, show, in his, in his fashion show, he used it as a wedding dress. But what I did with my um, uh, previous company, this was my first company, working again with light, I used to allow artists to do anything. They would come in and having had that artistic creative background, I realised actually it was the artists who were going to push the frontiers, it was the artists who were going to really find out what we could do with it. So I allowed them to rummage in the bins. And this is made from scrap. Uh, this, is a, this is the Royal Academy, actually, in London. Uh, it looks like grandma's doily tablecloth, which it illuminates when you move, when you have a dinner party, things start to happen, it all interacts. So I was doing lots of things like that. But eventually I wanted to move forward. I wanted to do something that was a little bit more, more concrete. And, and about six years ago, they decided to build the National Institute for Printed Electronics up here in the Northeast. I came to have a look, I saw what they were doing, and I realized an opportunity, so I put a company into it. I have two companies, really. I have one, which is this biophotonic research group, but we also have a, another company that we never really talk about, because it's top secret. And so, I'll just give you a little taste of We're doing very clever things with light emitting materials. We process them, we develop them, and we look for things to, how, how we can improve their capabilities. That's as much as I'm going to say. <laughs> Light. So as you can see, light is the common theme throughout my life. Even as a painter, painting is, is, is all about light as well. I mean, what we look at in the real world is just a reflection of the photo coming off physical surfaces. 
But we actually don't see very much. Our, our, the human eye is only capable of seeing a tiny fraction of what we consider the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's this fraction here. And, and most of it, we don't see. Animals sometimes see a little bit up here, a little bit down here. There's some animals have slightly wider bandwidth, but not much. And polyphotonics, we play with the full physical spectrum here, and when we use this spectrum. But we also work in the invisible. We work in the infrared, things that you can't see as well. And we're, doing, we're looking at all those points for the treatments of diseases. And that's what we've become. So we've sort of evolved from a company just interested in light to the application of light and what we can do with it. Apologies for that, but that's, that's, that's what we're trying to prevent. That's, that's what it's really like. And, and our first product that we went public with about, uh, only about a year ago uh, is a treatment for diabetic retinopathy. So diabetic retinopathy is a, a consequence of diabetes. And we all know the problems of diabetes. It's a global academic, uh, 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 epidemic. Uh, two types of diabetes, uh, type one, about 90% of people with type 1 will develop retinopathy at some point. If you live with diabetes long enough, it catches up with you. It's a dreadful disease. I think we're becoming normalized to diabetes. You know, the Today program, every single morning, has an article about it. We hear about it. In actual fact, it's a dreadful disease, and it's going to do things. It's shortening lives, but it's also killing uh, national healthcare services. We can't afford to live with it. The other problem, and this is the diabetes which is out of control, really, to do with lifestyle, 67% 67 of people will go on and develop some form of diabetic retinopathy. So, and the, and the figures are horrendous, you know, we're looking at 500 million globally, people suffering from it, 104 million people with diabetic retinopathy. That's just to say that what we are doing is, is a little bit more than just diabetic retinopathy, we're also developing treatments for wet, uh, age-related macular degeneration, these two diseases here are the two most common causes of blindness in the Western world. One's to do with the aging population. We just get old and we develop diseases. As you get old, inevitably you get this. Uh, this is one's lifestyle. This is very interesting, dry AMD. There is, currently isn't a treatment. It actually costs a great deal because we have to monitor it very carefully. And the reason we monitor it is because at some point this can flip into wet and wet is very, very aggressive. If you don't catch it at that very precise window, you can be diagnosed and blind in less than 12 months. It's an incredibly aggressive disease. So, back to snake skin oil. When I went to the NHS, we had some early data, we got some papers we put together and we showed the NHS this. They actually did think it was snake skin oil. So they started talking to people like Moorfields and people in Durham as well. Uh, and they commissioned a health economist report. And the health economist said, it's, it's worth a punt, basically. Because if it does work, that it's going to change things, it's a game changer. So they said, okay, here's a couple of million, don't waste it, and off I went. And uh, I developed all kinds of uh, 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 trials to do that. Now, what we don't fully realize is that the eye is actually part of the brain, it's brain tissue, and, and it's, it, it's part of the same uh, thing. It, what it does have is a membrane around it. The brain's protected by a membrane, which is why it's always very difficult to get drugs into the brain. The eye's the same which is why we have to inject drugs when we want to get a drug in. Um, but the eye is built back to front. And I think a good analogy is when you're looking at your TV screen and you have all the electronics behind, well, the eye is built. Imagine all the electronics in front. So you have to look through all the electronics to see the image. And that means that in the human eye, all the photoreceptors are at the front here. Sorry, the photoreceptors are at the back. But the, the vessels that deliver the blood and the oxygen, and the functionality, are all in front. And if that gets diseased, if you get a thickening of that layer, then you get a visual impairment. And that's the problem. Now, what we realized, because my company is basically a company of physicists and chemists, is that if we could play with the notion of, I'm going too far forward, I'll go back a little bit. When you go to sleep at night, counterintuitively, your eye asks for more oxygen. That's quite strange. And it does that because the rods and photo, the, you have two types of photoreceptor, the rod and the cone. Now the rod is what we use in daylight. Sorry, the cone is what we use in daylight. That's what we use all the time to see. It's, it's very good at uh, high light. The rod we use at twilight. And in the modern world, very, it's very infrequent we actually dark adapt fully. But we've only had electric light for you know, 100 years or so. 
And we used to use our rod to see in twilight. We used to use it an awful lot to walk around. Now, it's the rod that asks for all the oxygen. And when you go to sleep, it actually keeps on asking. It asks for more and more and more. So we get into a hypoxic state. We have an oxygen starvation. That happens to all of us. However, if you're old, <coughs> aged, or if you have diabetic retinopathy, uh, if you have a diabetes, then that new vessel growth, because the body stimulates it, the requirement, it meets the requirement for oxygen by stimulating new, new vessel growth, that vessel growth is compromised. It starts to leak, leak and break down and thicken the macula. You get little aneurysms where you can get cysts forming. And that's the disease. So we figured out that if we could put a measure of light in terms of a photon in, into the eye, without the cone seeing it, then we could suppress this oxygen demand. So we've broken the cycle at source. You no longer get this hypoxic state. It's that simple. It's actually taken a long time to work that out. And that theory isn't taught at the ophthalmic college. So when we talk to, talk to surgeons and we talk to people at the top of their game, there's initially there's quite a little scepticism, but eventually they come over to this quite, quite easily, in fact. So there's a little game you can play. This is the mask. You can probably see from the stage, there's a green, green glow there. This is 498 nanometers. And when you put it on your face, because you wear this at night when you're asleep, and you put it on your face like that, you can see a little bit of a green, green glow, but not very much. And that's because the cone is represented by this blue area here is actually not picking it up, so it doesn't inhibit sleep. And that's the clever bit. You wear it at night, and it doesn't inhibit sleep. And what it does is it, it's replacing two treatments. One is the interocular injection, and that happens six to seven, or possibly even eight times a year. Very, very expensive. The cost of that is about six and a half thousand, seven thousand pounds per eye per year to the NHS, and they are spending billions. The drug, the two most common drugs to do this have a six billion a year drug uh, and that's the, that's the thing we're tracing down. The other one, we call it a treatment, but it isn't really a treatment. It's photocoagulation, lasering at the back of the eye. And what we do basically is we scatter bomb very small sections of the, of the retina uh, until you run out of room. If you have seven or eight of these laser interventions, you start to lose peripheral eyesight, you lose your driving license, it's a whole world of pain. So we're replacing these two interventions. And I'll just show you, oh, what I didn't mention is that mask is full of electronics. This is the clever bit. It measures dosage, it knows if you're cheating. What we also worked out, because we ran some trials, people lie the most to their physicians. And they say, yeah, of course I've been wearing the mask. And they don't. So we worked out that if we really wanted to know, we had to make it clever. So it measures dosage, it measures dwell time. And we produce a lot of information like this. And, and that means we can actually, the patient can actually see whether the mask is working. This is uh, just some examples. So this, this, this poor chap here, has very severe maculopathy. This is uh, over the fovea, there's a cyst. That's a cyst there. And we can see over six, this chap is actually registered blind. He's all, had all the treatments going. He's had laser, he's had photocoagulation. And over six months, we can see a thinning of the macula there, and this fovea is returning. That natural little kiss shape there is perfectly natural. And we've got the fovea returning, it's much reduced. This is the same man, different type of scan. These are laser burns, by the way. We can't work miracles. His peripheral sight is already gone, it's been burnt away. But we are, what we are doing is reducing the thickness of the macula quite considerably, to the point where we get a measurable improvement of visual acuity, which is absolutely fantastic. It's important, it's really important, because the NHS, as I mentioned, is actually spending an awful lot of money on this. Now, with their own calculations, these are not our figures, it's NHS, they keep commissioning people to look at what the impact could be. And we've had in, anywhere from a billion a year to, this is one of the most recent ones, this, is, this was... Uh, uh, a commission from London Economics, and they said about 2.75 billion over nine years. But what the report actually says, with only uh, with an 85% discount attached, whichever way, it's an enormous amount of money. Uh, I'm not going to get political, but you can read that last sentence. The average time for the NHS to adopt a new medtech innovation is nine years. Nine years to adopt a new one. It's even worse for pharma. It's 17 years for pharma. So we've got, a, we've got a problem in the UK there. Um, the second thing we're doing is treating dry ND. We've got a lot of research there. In a nutshell, we're getting too complicated. As you age, the mitochondria, which is, I, 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 I had it explained to the mitochondria, is almost like a, the cell part, uh, the battery within a cell. What we found out that by using a different wavelength, actually in the invisible, we can actually stimulate the mitochondria and we can almost rejuvenate. It's like putting a charge back in. So we've been working with uh, flies, a lot of fly work, uh, and we've actually shown that we can dramatically increase the life of flies. 
And then we moved on to mice. I'm too fast, sorry. We moved on to mice, and we're getting a, 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 a very significant improvement in function in retina in the brain. And we now have human trials in development for that as well. And it's a completely different uh, pathology. It's a different kind of treatment. And this is, this is what we're developing for, for the dry MD. These masks actually, again, it's very important because you're working with a very high intensity infrared, infrared light that if you use for too long would actually blind you. So we've, we've developed all kinds of systems where we can measure that and only allow sort of a one minute dose per day. The second bit is just a really exciting development, uh, treatments of neonatal, neonatal jaundice. And we're developing all kinds of smart blankets now that are, are going to become comfortable, conformable, have to be disposable as well. Because what we hadn't fully realized, we thought it was a great idea, but little, little babies actually vomit and poo an awful lot continuously. So whatever you actually put in there has to be capable of just being thrown away. Um, but, but we're developing these things. And the clever thing about this is we can measure the doses applied to the, to the baby in the incubator very, very precisely. And, and in fact, uh, until recently, uh, overdosing the radiation to, to neonatal is one of the major causes of complications in teenage blindness in later years because those eyes are incredibly sensitive. So we're looking at all those things. So that's just a sort of snapshot of where we're going. Um, it is only a snapshot because a lot of it, we, again, we don't actually talk about. Uh, as I say, we went public about a year ago and, uh, and, and everybody's been very, very generous with the awards. We've won all kinds of awards. One thing we're really pleased about was this, the Institute of Engineering Technology, 100 Objects that Changed the World. And it's really good. And the NHS, even though they can't adopt, they'd love to adopt, they're the biggest funder and biggest research partner. They give us awards as well. So that's really nice. Thank you very much.